Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a wonderful weekend and it's not too hot, and not too rainy. There's lots of both of those things going on around the country. So um, we talked a few weeks ago about doing uh, annual um, uh, get togethers for your clients. So if you haven't done that yet, you last week was a reminder that now is the time to get going and get started on that because it's a great time. And these things are not that expensive to do. It's a great time to uh, kind of nurture your clients and work on getting those um, uh, the ability to get referrals down the road. So make sure if you haven't done that, you at least take a look at these things. It's not They're not that difficult, not that expensive to do. I wanted to talk today about this uh, book I read called um, To Sell as Human by Daniel Pink. And maybe some of you are aware of who Daniel Pink is, but he's written a lot, lots of uh, awesome uh, books. So his point is that in today's world, how many people sell? How many salespeople are in today's world? Yeah, everybody is. Everybody's selling something. I mean, when we're dating, we're selling ourselves to our girlfriends. With you know, when when we are married, we're selling uh, where we want to go on vacation versus where our our spouse or kids want to go on vacation. Um, we're constantly kind of selling stuff. Now we make a living doing that, but his point is everybody sells. Everybody sells. In his in his research, he's found and and we basically his research. A lot of it is mirroring what we've been doing for 20 years, uh, but but the newest research is basically validating everything we're doing with a little, some little twists here or there that I think are worthwhile knowing. So one of the, one of the big things he points out is that, uh, and he references this Ferlazza, who's a sales expert right now. Um, Ferlazza makes dif- distinction between irritation and agitation. So irritation, he says, is challenging people to do something that we want them to do. By contrast, agitation is challenging them to do something that they want to do. So what he discovered through our career is that irritation does not work. So we want, we can, uh, well, I'll just finish this. Irritation does not uh, work. It might be effective for the short term, but to move people fully and, deep, and deeply requires something more. Not looking at the student or the patient as a pawn on a chessboard, but as a full participant in the game. So we irritate people. As salespeople, we irritate people that, oh, they're paying too much in taxes. Oh, they're, uh, they could do better on an investment. Oh, they're, you know, they're paying too much in fees. Oh, their guy made a mistake. If all we do is irritate them, they, they, they get it. They, you know, they, they're irritated. But the problem is how long before they change their mind and think, oh, I'll just leave everything as it is. If we irritate them like that, if we point out to them, if we irritate them that, hey, look at, you're paying too much in fees. Hey, hey, look at, um, this guy's taking a minute. Hey, yeah, as soon as they walk out the door, that starts to dissipate, and that's where we we're confused because we irritated them. They were irritated when they left. Holy cow, they were irritated. And then we get this call saying, uh, "We're just going to leave everything is, or uh, we don't want to move forward, or we're just going to think about it." We're like, "What the heck happened?" It's because we irritated them. But what is the 21 point checklist using motivational interviewing? What is that doing? Is that irritating them or getting them agitated about their current situation? Yeah, it's agitating. They're Sue. They're exactly right. They're that's right, Liliana. So they're 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 coming to their own conclusions that I need to make changes. So the, the irritation is is very um, uh, it fools us because we think they left and they were angry. But if we're the ones that are irritating them, that only works <laughs> for a short period of time, and then they go right back to the status quo. We need to be able to agitate them, have them become agitated about their current situation where they uh, feel that uh, they want to make a change. So we were brought into the business with this. Uh, Who knows what movie this is from? As salespeople, we should all know what movie this is from. Come on, somebody. Yeah, everybody's getting it. Tom's got it. Michael's got it. Glenn Gary and Ross, right. So he's saying, always be closing. That's the way we were... uh, uh, brought in, but things have changed drastically. That no longer works. With baby boomers, if you're if you're always closing, how long are they going to put up with you? They're not. They're going to kick you out. So the new rules, the new ABCs of selling are attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. So we're going to go through those today. So uh, attunement means uh, empathetic attunement, uh, t- attuning into uh, you know, uh, th- their uh, bodily empathy, uh, emotional cognitive sensing, facilitating. Into, these are fancy words for just saying what? We get we get into the client's shoes. 
We can see the world through their eyes. That's what attunement is. So prior to this, when we were selling, when we were selling to um, the greatest generation, we presented ourselves as an authority. So as an authority, guess what we thought? What is, did we care what they thought? No. What did we thought? What did we thought? What did we think? I'm just going to be. You know, I'm going to show them what's the right thing to do. I'm going to show them the river. I'm going to solve all their problems. I'm going to do this for them. I, 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 right? But I doesn't work with baby boomers. They have to be in charge. We need to see the world through their eyes. We need to speak in their language. We cannot present to them any longer. So they found that um, this is a graph of empathy versus feeling of power. Now, feeling of power is what we felt with um, the greatest generation. We felt we know more than them. We're the authority. We're the experts. We're the educated. Look at all the letters behind my name. Feelings of power. So what they found, especially in today's world, is that the greater um, your feeling of power, the more you start to feel like it's us versus them. I'm going to win. I'm going to get them to do what I want. I'm in charge. Feelings of uh, empathy means less uh, feel, um, feeling of power. Then you have compassion and gratitude and elevation. You, you can't be too. You can't be so empathetic with no feeling of power because you're not. Nothing's going to get accomplished. You can't be feeling so in charge because nothing's going to get accomplished. You have to have a balance of both empathy, being able to see the world through their eyes, and Understanding that you are an authority. That's this is the sweet spot of the bell curve. Sharing, cooperation, and altruism. We're helping each other. We're both moving forward. So I'm going to do a little test uh, for you. So everybody, um, um, everybody, do me a favor with your finger right now. I want you to take your finger and I want you to write a capital E on your forehead. So everybody, write a capital E on their forehead. Write a capital E on your forehead right now. Not even thinking about it. Write a capital E on your forehead. Okay, you all done? Let me hear. So let me see a lot of whys if you're all done. Write a capital E on your forehead. Let me see a lot of whys. Okay, what this study, and this study was like 92% accurate because then they followed it up with a other um, uh, test. Think about this. Did you write the E so that when you looked in the mirror, if you the E that you wrote on your forehead, if you looked in the mirror, would it look backwards or would it look like it was uh, like a normal E. So does it look backwards or like a normal E? We got some both, both, both ways. So what they found is if you're empathetic, guess which way it would show. If you're ep empathetic, guess way it's, what it's going to look like. It's going to look like a normal E. Because you're more worried about how the world will see that E than how you'll see the E. If you wrote it backwards, it means you're more authority driven, that you think that the way you, you view the world through your eyes, not other people's eyes. So, I mean, there's strengths to both of those as we just saw with that graph. But what we want to do is balance. And, and, and what they did find out is um, successful salespeople, successful salespeople, which way do you think they wrote it? So that the person could see it or so that they could see it? Yeah, so that the person looking at the E, so it looked right. So if you wrote it backwards, if you wrote it backwards, that tells you that you have, you have some things to work on. You have some things to work on, that you want to be able to spend more time gossiping. Make sure if, you're, if you wrote the E backwards, you better spend a, a 15 minute, doing a 15-minute drill, you better spend a 30-minute, uh, do, do two 15-minute drills a, a day till you can turn that around. Because Gatsing is about doing that, about seeing the world through other people's eyes. That 15-minute drill is about seeing uh, the world through other people's eyes. So, they, so uh, it's not that you're a bad person if you wrote it backwards, but it does mean that if you want, in today's world, want to get what you want, you're going to have to readjust the way you think. And instead of trying to get people to do what you want, you're going to have to readjust and start figuring out how to get people what they want, if that makes sense. Makes Kind of a cool little thing, isn't it? So you, they found all the research is that to incre you increase your power to get things done by reducing it. What have I told you about putting a, a professional designations behind your name? This validates my whole point. What have I told you about putting all these freaking letters behind your name? Yeah, it's not good. 
Because what it does is it tells people that, look, it, I'm more powerful than you. And when you start acting more powerful than, than they do, what do they do? Baby boomers. What do baby boomers do? They push you back. So Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management. These are guys that are a bunch of doughheads, right? Don't know anything about what they're talking about, right? So if a per they found in their studies that if a person feels more powerful, that you know they have more knowledge, they have more expertise, that they're in control, the more power a person feels, they only see things from their own perspective. That's that whole backwards E. If a person feels low power, the other person may feel they, that they, they think, oh, that other the person I'm talking to may know more than me. They may have a different perspective than me. Uh, they may view the world differently than me. I don't have all of the answers. When you feel that they have that low power, it leads people to see things from other people's points of view. And who do you think in today's world sells better? People who only can see things through that you know that feel really powerful and it's my way or the highway and I'm the expert here and why can't you see that this is better for you and why can't you see that uh, you're going to reduce your, why can't you you know that's that whole thing. So low power is better because you're saying hmm. Uh, you know, maybe they have a better point. Let's let's work through this together. Let me ask you some questions and see if we're on the same page here. Let's walk through this logically. Let's let's go through it at your speed because I don't have all the answers. So when you do low power, low power is far more successful. Far, far, far more successful. See, the the thing is, it used to be that power worked. It used to be with the greatest generation that power worked. Why doesn't that work anymore? Besides the fact that they're a different personality, that the greatest generation Respected authority, baby boomers don't respect authority, but there's another big thing that has changed and why power doesn't work anymore. Why doesn't power work anymore? Ah, that's right, Sue. Because of the internet, people have access to information they never had access before. So the, the greatest generation, when we were selling in the uh, early 2000s and the 1990s, they didn't have a place to go do research. They weren't. They didn't have all this information at their fingertips. They have that information now. That's why power or authority no longer works. See, we used to be able to lord over them that I'm the expert, that I have all the answers, that I have all the information. I know things that you don't know. D is that really the case anymore? How many experts on, in finances and investing are on your block that you live on? Yeah, all of them. They all think they're what? All your neighbors think, especially after the longest, the longest stock market run in history. What does everybody think at this point when it comes to the stock market? Yeah, they all think they're geniuses. They all think they're they're geniuses. See, <laughs> so they and they have and they have. Do they have information that validates that they're geniuses? Is it easier for them to look up information that's going to validate their opinion of themselves? Yeah. So right, so we have two problems, and you know you've heard me talk about this in the in the age of distrust, is that because we're selling to baby boomers instead of um, uh, the greatest generation, and because there's so much more information available today, being authority does not work. Having letters behind your name does not work. Being an expert does not work. You need to be an emotional chameleon. You need to blend. You have to assume a p position of lower power. Let them be the expert. Anything, uh, anything worth saying, any statement worth making should be made by who? When you're talking to a prospect, them, that's right. Any statement, any point, any piece of information that's worth making should be made by them. And if it's not worth making, guess what? If there's something that should not, it's not worth, a point not worth be making, then let's what? Not make it. Not make it. So therefore, and uh, I'm just going to, uh, I, I ran into a couple of great uh, producers or uh, great advisors here last week talking to them, and uh, they were scratching their heads because they did a pretty darn good job on their, their, um, um, on their presentations to the client, but the client still wanted to go back and talk to their, to their um, client, to their um, advisor. So how do we know for sure is it, do we have a rule, a 10-minute rule that we know for sure how well a good job we did? Is there a 10-minute rule that we can use to see how well we did? See if anybody remembers this. I think it's been three or four months since I've talked about it. 
Okay, nobody's remembering it. Well, that's a good thing I'm talking about it again. When you tape your meetings, okay, and then you're reviewing them, just randomly select, randomly select some place uh, in there. So I, I close my eyes and I move it forward, I stop, and I end up being, I end up at 43 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to go from 43 minutes, 10 minutes is then 53 minutes, right? And then I'm going to count how many open-ended questions that I ask in that 10-minute period. What have I told you about all my, um, the, when I made a million dollars and all my other advisors that have made more than a million dollars, when, when we've counted their open-ended questions, how many open-ended questions do they average per minute? Two. They average two per minute. Now, I, that's what I averaged when I made my million. Today, how many questions do I ask? Open-ended questions do I ask per minute? Two or way more than that? <laughs> way more than that. So, but two, min two open-ended questions, two who, what, where, why, when, how questions per minute, that's what you got to do to make a million dollars. So, I, I had them both go back. I had them both go back and, and look at that. And what and what did they find? Now one wasn't uh, one wasn't able to to record it <laughs> for whatever reason, but the other one went back and counted and guess how many he found that he was asking per per in that ten minute period. He should have had how many in those in that ten minute period? Twenty, yeah. But he, I don't know how you knew that. Um, uh, let's see who gave me the right answer. Nick Nick said he had five. I don't know how you knew that because it's not Nick that that did that. But yeah, he had five instead of twenty. So here's the thing. On a scale of one to ten, we have some people who are really were right place, right time. So as far as difficulty to sell them, they're number one. They're a one. And then we have people who are really difficult to sell, and they're at a ten. And then we have everybody right in between, right in between uh, the uh, uh, the difference, right? So, so we have a uh, we have uh, some people who are twos in difficulty, three in difficulties, five in difficulty, seven in difficulties. But if you get a, if you get a ten in difficulty. How many open-ended questions had you better be asking per minute? At least two. Because if, let's say you have a meeting that's an hour and a half long, so what's an hour, let's say two hours long. Two hours is 60 minutes, so that, or, uh, two hours is 200, is, oh, I'm gonna try this again, 120 minutes. So how many open-ended questions should we hear? Yeah, 120, uh, how many open-ended questions should we hear? 240, so if a 10, a 10 in difficulty, 240 times, sometimes in little ways, sometimes in blunt, black and white ways, tell themselves that their guy is screwing them. What's a 10 going to do? A 10 in difficulty, what are they going to do? They're going to move. If they, if they tell themselves 240 times that they need to leave, they're going to leave. So if I only instead I'm asking a quarter of the time, asking, you know, they're only giving me the, a quarter of that time telling me they're going to leave. What's that? Am I going to get a 10 in difficulty? Am I going to get a 9 in difficulty? I'll probably get a 5, 6, or maybe even a 7 in difficulty, but I'm not going to get that other group. Does that make sense? So I got to assume a position of lower power. Let them be the expert. Let them be the smart person. Let them tell themselves what to do instead of us telling uh, uh, what them what to do. We need to see things through other people's eyes. So uh, they also they did a negotiation research, and this is pretty interesting to me. I got this answer wrong. So a negotiation experiment, and they said uh, they put pitted two people against each other. One was selling something, one was buying something, okay? And they had to agree on a price. Does that make sense, everybody? That what I'm saying there? So they 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 they, they the one person they said you're going to sell this item, the other person says you're going to buy this item. You have to agree on a price. You're going to negotiate on a price. And then they, they uh, uh, broke it into three different groups. One group, they said, now imagine what the other person is feeling. The second group, they said, imagine what the other side is thinking. And then they had a controlled, controlled group. They gave them no instructions whatsoever. One of those groups had a 76% higher satisfaction of both parties. Which one do you think it is? The one that they said, hey, imagine what the other person's feeling. Imagine what he's thinking. Or imagine, or there was no directions whatsoever. Yeah, you guys are all good. I don't feel so bad because I, uh, I said feeling too. And so everybody's saying feeling, feeling, feeling. That's what I said too. That's the wrong answer. They found that when they told, I said, what, think about what the other person is thinking. That's, the pers that's when they had the highest degree of satisfaction. And if you think that, that makes sense because do, 
do we know what our prospect, if you do the 21 point checklist properly, do you know what the other person's uh, thinking? Yes, how do we know what the other person's thinking? Because we ask them then open-ended questions and they tell us, exactly. That's why we close 100% of people. That's why it's less stressful for you and less stressful for them when you ask those two open-ended questions per minute minimum because they don't feel pressured. You don't feel pressured because they're selling themselves. And that's why both of you will have a high satisfaction. I thought it was feeling too. Nope, they found out uh, that basically there was a very little difference between the control group and the feeling group. There's very little difference between them. But that when you started to think, what's the other person thinking? That's when the, the um, satisfaction went through the roof. And we don't have to just think about what the other person's thinking. We can know with our system, with motivational interviewing, we can know what they're thinking. So that's, that's a great thing about asking open-ended questions. Everybody's going to win. It's a win-win. Another thing they found um, in, in research was that he, humans naturally mimic. Because if you don't mimic, the, you know, in the caveman days, if you didn't act like everybody else, guess what they did? In caveman days, if you did not um, act like everybody else, if you were the weirdo of the group, what'd they do? Kicked you out of the cave. Kicked you out of the cave. So that's why naturally, if, you, if, if you're speaking to somebody with a, uh, an English accent, what do you naturally start to do? It's stupid, but what do you naturally start to do? Maybe I'm the only guy that does this. When I'm speaking with a guy with an English accent, I, I, I start to speak a little bit more with an English accent. When you're dancing on the dance floor, do you want to be the weirdo dancing, like the weird, like nobody else is dancing? Or what do most people want to do? When you look at a dance floor, what is what is 90% of the people doing? Same kind of dance. They're not doing weird dances. They're, they're doing the same thing. Even when it comes to, have you noticed that when somebody starts using a word like legit, or um, you know, a lib or dude. What do people? What do you start to do? What do you start to do when when you when somebody using a word like that? What do you naturally start to do? That's that's how when that's what that's what drives the millennials crazy because millennials will come up with an awesome word and what do, what do we boomers do? We use it to the point where the millennials get sick of it and quit using it because it's no longer cool, right? <laughs> so, um, but that's what we do naturally. Is we hear, uh, we start using words other people uh, use. So, human beings were hardwired to blend in, to act like other people, and you can use that when you're when you're uh, helping people decide what they want to do. So there's lots of different things that we call, we call it mirroring, we call it neuro-linguistic program, we call it all sorts of different things. But essentially what it comes down to is strategically, strategically, strategically underlined mirroring. It has much better results. Don't copy exactly, strategically mirroring. You don't copy exactly, but instead you, you mirror what they're doing um, uh, subtly. Listen to what they say, but be aware of casually mirroring them. So watch their arms, their legs. Are they leaning in or out? Do they talk fast? Do they talk slow? Are they using certain expressions? When you start to, to notice those things, wait. Don't immediately copy them. Wait. Give it 10 to 15 seconds. Then think about following suit in a subtle way. And you don't want to do this too many times, but instead salt it into the conversation. So you don't want to act like if they lean back, you immediately lean back. If they lean back, lean back, you take 10, 15 seconds, and then you lean back. If they put their hand up to their chin, you wait 10 or 15 seconds, you put your hand up to the chin. And you don't do exactly everything, but you start to salt it in. And then you wane. Begin to take your mind off of the mirroring and then let it happen naturally. So you want to be conscious of it initially. And then once you're conscious of it, you're, let your subconscious take over. And the subconscious is going to just naturally, uh, at a, at a, in a slower manner, start to do what they say in a more subtle way. So we're not trying to be false, but instead subtly letting them know that they are among friends, that we are alike. That's what, with mirroring them, you're not manipulating. You're just doing what, what we've been doing for since we were cavemen, which is what? Fitting in. People are comfortable with those people that are like them, who speak like them. I mean, I used to, before I started to do this, 
I didn't make a million dollars a year uh, until I started to do this because how fast do I talk in real life? Fast or slow? And when I was with clients, guess what I used to tell myself when I was making 50 grand a year? Well, that's the way I talk. I can't change that. That's just my nature. I'm, I think fast, I talk fast. Blah, 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 blah. And then when I quit making excuses and started to slow, you know, when I was talking to, to um, seniors, when I was talking to my primary marketplace, I talked slower. I talked at their speed. You have to move at their speed. You have to, to strategically uh, um, uh, copy or mimic them. This makes a huge difference. Also, they talk, do I talk, you know, we talk about aping, so do we talk about parroting? In the book, he talked about parroting, saying the exact same thing that people say. And what they found is that when waiters, this is just an example of it, tips went up 70% when they parroted versus paraphrasing. When, when, when they par when tips went up 70% when they paired it back word for word what the order was. If I said, uh, I would like a steak, no pink, uh, baked potato with all the works. Okay, so you'd like a steak, no pink, baked potato, all the works. When the, that was, was that parroting or is that paraphrasing? That's parroting, exactly. So if, if they paraphrase, so you'd like a, uh, so I say, I would like a steak, no pink, and baked potato with all the works. Okay, so you'd like a, a well-done steak, and you'd like um, a baked potato, and you'd like all of the things. You want sour cream, uh, uh, onions, and everything else on it. That's what, parroting or paraphrasing? And they found that if they parroted exact words, so when we're gotting them, we don't want to paraphrase. We want to use their exact words. And obviously, can we agree that parroting is powerful? Parroting is extreme. And this is just one of the studies that they talked about this. So that's attunement. B is buoyancy. Buoyancy. How do we stay up? You know, because we're, we're in the business, and do we get more yeses or noes in our business? Get way more noes. We have to be able to deal with uh, rejection. So do, does anybody remember a Stuart from the Saturday Night Live? I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me. Looking in the mirror, talking to themselves. So what did they find out about um, think t positive talking? Good thing or bad thing? Does not work. Does not work. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it doesn't work. Instead, what they found out is what Bob the Builder does is a better way to stay positive. So who's going to win? Bob the Builder with um, um, can we fix it? Yes, we can or not being able to fix it. Who's going to win all day long? Bob the Builder or, or Negative Nelly? Yes, we can. Bob's going to win. Exactly. Bob's going to win. They found out that you know when you if you approach a and when something happens and and you just say um, ask yourself can we fix it and and then you you know that you can you ask yourself can we fix it and then start writing down why you can fix it why you can fix it. So for example, let's, let's say that my, my closing ratio was, I've just sat down with three people, all of them had, uh, in the last month, all of them had more than a million dollars, and I didn't close any of them. I didn't close any of them. So what's my natural inclination? So Jeff, when, Jeff, when, you, when you hear a guy's not close three million dollar people, what are some of the varying different degrees of what people will say, what advisors will say when they, they muff on three, three different um, big cases? Oh, they'll say things like, um, well, you know, these people, they've been with their guy for 20 years and they just, you know, they really liked him and they just couldn't pull the trigger. Or, yep. um, you know, we, we just like managing our own portfolio and we've done a good job and so we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. They always kind of look outward. Oh, well, yeah, they're saying that these people had reasons not I can't move. fix. Or they'll beat them. Yeah, I can't fix. Or they'll actually beat themselves up and say, yeah, I probably didn't do it well enough. I, I need to ask some more open-ended questions. I probably could have did things. But, I mean, they'll either point outwards actually, and, and blame everybody but themselves, 
or they'll blame themselves. Are either one of those things going to fix fix the situation, guys? No, you're right. They're not going to. Instead, it's is is that are those a, a positive? When you start to point outwards that it's other people's fault or that hey, I did I did a bad job. Um, if you start to do either one of those things, are those positive or negative feelings? Those are negative feelings. Instead, you should say, boy, I missed those three guys that I could have helped a lot. Can I fix this going forward? Can I fix this? Yes, I can. So then what would you write down and how you could fix that? Maybe not with those folks because you know what? Like we talked about last week, do we want people in that maybe filing cabinet? Do we want a maybe filing cabinet? Or if they've said no, they said no. We're going to drip on them. We may get them later. But, we're, but once they've said no, guys, what's the likelihood of you chasing them and getting them? If you've muffed it, you did a lousy 21 or didn't do the 21 where they told themselves, what's the likelihood you're going to – all you can do is drive them away. Instead of driving them away by chasing them, I'm just going to drip on them and come back later and still get them back lead down the road. But if I, if I go after them hard, guess what? They'll, they'll just – they'll ghost me permanently. I don't want that to happen. But now let's go back to, geez, I've muffed up these three cases. Can I fix it? Yes, I can. So how are you going to write down, list specifically, reasons why you can fix it? What could you do to fix that? So that the next three guys with lots of money came in, you would get them. What could you do to fix it? More open-ended questions, Daniel. Good. That's one. Yep. What else? Slow down, maybe? Yeah. Got more? More open-ended questions? Practice 5Q more? All those are great, great answers. Best parroting more? Yeah, all those things are good. Uh, so so what would be the – so you might say, uh, list specific reasons why you can. I'm going to be awesome at, at GOTS because I'm going to do the 15-minute drill not once a day but three times a day. So I'm going to be awesome at GOTS. Or you can say, I'm going to be awesome at open-ended questions because I'm going to uh, go back and learn the scripts better. Or you're going to say, I'm going to be awesome because if I don't ask – if I don't ask two open-ended questions – per minute. I'm going to listen to my tape of my next meeting, and if I don't ask two open-ended questions per minute, I'm going to write a $5,000 check to the Democrats if I'm a Republican and to the Republicans if I'm a Democrat. Guess what would magically happen if you said if you made that commitment to yourself? Guys, think about this. People tell me it's so hard to ask open-ended questions, and <laughs> it's not. I, do, how would you like me to – guys, would you like me to fix you immediately and make sure you become experts at asking two open-ended questions per minute? I can do it in about 10 minutes. you want me to do that for you? Yeah, Kevin knows the answer. Okay, a lot of people are saying, yeah, sure, okay. Well, then what you do is you fly me out, fly me out, put me up at a first-class hotel, and then I'm going to show up to your meetings that day with a loaded 45. Some people have heard me say this. A lot of people haven't apparently though. With a loaded 45, and I'm gonna say, anytime anything comes out of your mouth except an open-ended question, I'm gonna shoot you in the kneecap. Now, guess what? All your <laughs> things coming out of your mouth are gonna be an open-ended question. Now, will there be maybe long periods of time, maybe one or two minutes, where you're like, shoot, how do I say this with a who, what, where, why, when, how? Could there be some awkward gaps in uh, in, in your questions? Awkward silences. Sure. Could there be some awkward questions? Sure. But here's the funny thing. Not 10 years, 10 months, 10 days, 10 weeks, but within 10 minutes. Guess what's going to happen to your open-ended questions when you have that kind of focus on asking open-ended questions? Within 10 minutes. What's going to happen to those awkward silences? They're going to get shorter. What's going to happen to the awkward questions? They're going to get smoother. So it has nothing to do with I can't. It has to do with what? Ain't one of you on this call that couldn't do this, couldn't ask more open-ended questions. It's just that you don't have the focus on it yet. So if you say, I, I miss these cases, I want to make sure that never happens again. I need to ask, learn to ask more open-ended questions. See, there's, you start writing down things that you could do. Uh, can we fix it? Yes, I can. Write down what you can do to fix the problem. And if you're having problems coming over that list, Jeff, would you be more than happy to, to, to walk through a list with somebody to help them fix any problem they're having? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and so would I. So would I. 
you, you got to have this mentality. Has anybody seen uh, seen this movie, All is Lost, with uh, Robert Redford? This is the mentality you have to have. So he's he's sailing, and one problem – he's all by himself. His radio, I mean, his radio gets busted. I mean, everything that can go wrong goes wrong. And he, this is a – I would recommend everybody watch this movie. Everything that goes wrong can go wrong, and guess – how emotionally upset he gets when something goes wrong. He doesn't. He goes, oh, that's broken. Guess what I need to do? I need to fix it. So then he deals with it. And then the next thing happens. I mean, I would have put him a bullet in my head about halfway, about a quarter of the way in the movie if those that many things went wrong, because I'd be like, I'm out of here. But he just, he just takes a breath, fixes it, takes it, deals with it, deals with it, deals with it. That's the kind of mentality we have to have. But instead, what do we tend to do when we miss cases? What do we tend to do? What happens to our emotions? Do we think, can we fix it? Yes, we can. Or do we get all emotional and, and either I'm, you know, the world's bad, um, uh, the, uh, I'm bad. Do those things, either one of those uh, mentalities help? No, they don't. And the thing is, guys, we have, I predicted 22 years ago, what your clients would say 22 years in the future, you have the thing that can fix any problems you have. Just a matter is, do you, do you want to get emotional about it? Or do you want to be by the builder and say, can we fix it? Yes, we can. So you want to have a positive positivity ratio. Again, this is, we're still talking right about how, uh, humans sell. Uh, that, this is right out of the book. The research they found with positivity ratio, they found that if you have three positive thoughts for every negative one you have, you're going to be flourishing and in peak performance. If you have, so you can see uh, two negative thoughts for every one, one to one, every po one positive thought for every negative thought, uh, one positive thought or two positive thoughts for every one, you're managing to keep your head above water. But if you have three positive thoughts for every one, that's where you're going to flourish because you're going to be moving forward instead of uh, lamenting the past. That's all the way up to 11 to one. So if you have 11 positive thoughts to one negative one, you're flourishing and you're peak performing. What they found that once you started to go above 12 positive thoughts to every negative thought, you're a little bit crazy <laughs> because that, that, there ain't nobody that positive. And you're that positive, you've, you've disengaged with reality. So there, there's a, you, there's, um, you can actually go to this, uh, just Google um, positivity ratio, uh, and you can take this test to see where you're at. Take your test to where you, see where you're at. I squeaked out a three to one positive <laughs> positivity ratio. So just barely squeaked out. So I'm not the most positive person in the world, but I'm positive enough to flourish. So, but I would highly recommend that you take this. And if you're very negative, guess what? Gonna have to work on that. Gonna have to work on that. Positivity can be expressed by being amused, laughter, appreciation, gratitude, joy, interest, inspiration, hope, pride. These, if you, you want a three to one to, to eleven to one, thinking about these things versus the negative. What have they told? What has all the studies told you about becoming a happier person and a healthier person? What should you do every night or every morning? What should you do? Come up with a couple of things that you're grateful for. A couple of things that you're thankful for. Do those two things. You're going to be a happier person and you're going to be a healthier person. Start with gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. See, we have to deal with rejection. Now, there's some different ways we can deal with rejection. So what they found is that sales, the, the way a salesperson sees a rejection has a lot to do with the positivity ratio when it comes to selling. So you can look at it as being temporary or permanent. So if I muffed three cases, if I muffed three cases with million dollars each, I could say, the system doesn't work. You know what? People are never going to move. People are bad. People are always going to be stupid and not do this thing. This is never going to work. You could say that, or you could say, wow, I really muffed those. Can I fix this? Yes, I can. If I think that way, is, am I viewing it as a temporary problem or a permanent problem? Can I fix it? Yes, I can. Am I looking at it as a temporary problem or a permanent problem? Temporary, exactly. If I look at it as a permanent problem that every this system doesn't work, I'm never or the system does work, but I'm never going to get it. Or people are stupid; they're going to always do the wrong thing. If I think of it if, uh, as a permanent 
problem, guess what it's going to magically become? Permanent. Specific versus universal. Everybody's going to be, everybody uh, um, that wants, that has good advisors, they're just going to stay with their guy. Or, um, you know what, this isn't going to work because participation rates are so low. Is that a universal or a specific mentality? That's universal. Specific, again, comes right down to, can we fix it? Yes, I can. How am I going to work with this person to fix it? Or these three things that I missed, the system doesn't work, or I'm never going to learn the system, or people are stupid. Is that a universal or a specific way of looking at things? Universal. So specifically, I'd say, you know what, with these three specific cases, I wasn't on my game. I didn't know the scripts as well as I should. I did not ask as many open-ended questions as I should have been asking to let them be the expert instead of myself. I um, didn't get on their side, or I didn't recognize that they were defending themselves. I need to get better at that. So, so can we fix it? Yes, I can. And I understand why though, those specific cases that I lost, but if I saw them again after I fixed these things, I would have gotten them. Would have gotten them. So you can also take an optimism test. There's a lot. Just type in optimism test. There's lots of optimism tests out there. So you want to be uh, opti uh, optimistic. External versus per internal. We talk about this all the time, don't we? They're, those people are stupid. The interest rates are too low. Participation rates are too low. It's never going to – no. You, you got to be uh, blame external or take it personal. Yeah, in, in, you got to be internal because can we control anything that's external? Can we control anything that's external? Nope. So it's better to be personal. Again, you can take that optimism test and it, uh, any of these optimism tests and work on being optimistic. Today, I choose to be happy. So when you begin your day with gratitude or you begin your, or, or uh, what's going to naturally happen? You're going to choose to be happy that day. You realize that things are good. So that's the B. That's buoyancy, how to stay up. Clarity. Clarity is the ability to help others see their situations in new and more revealing ways. Isn't that what we do at the 21-point checklist in motivational interviewing? Help others see the situations in new, more revealing ways? and to identify problems they didn't know existed. So guys, if I had cancer and I'm walking through the, the airport, if I have cancer and I'm walking through the airport and I see a newspaper that says, the cure to cancer has been found, what's the likelihood I'm going to buy that paper? What's the likelihood I'm going to buy that paper? I'm getting uh, very likely. Everybody's saying very likely. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. The reason is, is just because I have cancer, do I know I have it? Are there people walking around today that have cancer don't know they have cancer? So if I don't know I have cancer, am I going to buy that paper? No. So what we want to do is help people identify the problems they didn't think they, that they knew existed. And what's the biggest problem that they have right now that they didn't know before they began to see us? What's the biggest problem that, that's right? Their advisor is taking advantage of them, is, is ripping them off, is, is not giving them all the information. And the reason they're not giving them all the information is because they would have made different decisions which are, would have hurt the advisor, meaning the advisor put his own concerns above his client's concerns. The advisor certainly was not being a fiduciary. So Berkeley found that being a leader is being able to frame a problem in an interesting way. See the true problem. Do we know, do we see the true problem? Is, that, are they paying too, is paying too much in taxes, paying too much in fees, not having the non-financial done? Is that the problem, guys? Is that their problem? No, their problem is the guy is withholding information because he doesn't know, doesn't care, he's doing it on purpose. See, they have to be able to see the true problem before jumping in to solve it. We have to have – being a leader is being able to frame a problem in an interesting way so the, the person can see the true problem before jumping in 
to solve it. So if all we do is solve that they're paying, if all we point out is they're paying too much in fees, paying too much in taxes, they, they have too low a tenure or too high a turnover. If all we do, those things are, that's jumping in to fix it. But if they actually fix the problem, if they fix those problems, and they fix the problem, if they fix those problems, no, because the problem is not those things. The problem is the guy who is causing those things. It's their advisor. See, in today's world, two long-standing sales skills have been stood on their head. In the past, we provided with information. So with, uh, with the greatest generation, we were giving them information they had no other way of getting. But now we must be adept at helping clients identify information that really affects them because baby boomers, how much information do they have at their fingertips? The greatest generation had virtually no information. The baby boomers have unbelievable amounts of information, too much information. So it's our job to help them weed through that information and find the information that actually affects them. Do we do that with the 21-point checklist? Do we do that with the FIA presentation? Yeah. Second thing is we used to have to be skilled at answering questions. Now we must be skilled at asking questions because the only person some the baby boomer is going to believe is who there's only one person that a baby boomer is going to believe in who is that themselves exactly nick exactly, exactly right so there this is an example of of another thing with clarity which is that there was a this is back in the 19 geez i think 1940s um with sugarman joe sugarman uh actually came uh, uh this is a story about him whether it's true or not we don't know but this is the story that he and his buddy were walking through Central Park, and they found there was a, a blind man there and said, uh, I'm blind, please help. And everybody was walking right by him, right by him, right by him. Nobody, nobody uh, uh, was putting money into the can. And Sugarman said, I could fix that. I can fix that immediately. And the, the, so that he, he and his buddy had a bet for I don't know what their bet was, but um, they had a bet that Sugarman could fix it, and he did fix it. Does anybody remember or heard this story? How did he, how did he fix this uh, – uh, blind man's situation where people were, gave him money and over a fist. Ah, he changed the sign, Ron. So what did he change the sign to? Remember? Okay. So, Ron, you got that right there. You changed the sign. He said, I am blind and it is spring. I am blind and it is spring. So what immediately jumps through your mind? I'm able to enjoy this, this summer day. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. The blind man can hear the birds singing, but I can see the birds, the flowers, the trees. It's beautiful, and this guy can't see anything. So what, what we're able to what, – what that did, and he started to get money hand over fist because when they were blind, they had nothing to – oh, yeah, poor guy, he's blind. But when they said he's blind and he can't see what you're seeing, all of a sudden there was clear, clear in people's minds. See, do you see it? It's a contrast. They had contrast. He's blind. It is spring. So they started to say, oh, I can see the contrast. I can, do, I can see things he can't see. I can see all this beautiful stuff happen. He can't. But without that extra, it is spring, people didn't have that contrast. They didn't have the contrast of, of what, what they had versus him. When he said he was blind, they said, wow, that's bad. You know, he, he doesn't, he's not able to see. But they weren't saying boy, it's bad for him. He's not able to see, but boy, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to see. They were just saying, oh, too bad about that guy. When you said, I'm blind and it is spring, all of a sudden, instead of just saying, oh, it's too bad for that guy, they're saying, oh, it's too bad for that guy because I can see a lot of things he can't see. Do you see the contrast there? Do you see the difference between the two signs? And that's, we, we want contrast. That's why, you know, if you go to the eye doctor, they don't say, hey, there's a bunch of glasses there on the table. Go ahead and try one that makes you see better. You're good to go. No, they put us in those, okay, which is better, left or right? Click, click, left or right? Click, click, left or right? Click, click. We have to use contrast. Do we use contrast with the 21-point checklist, and do we use contrast with the uh, FIA presentation? And how often do we use it? Constantly. People cannot see. People cannot – they need a comparison. You know, when I sold TVs, we always made sure – that there was a uh, if they came in for a fifty dollar TV, we'd show them the fifty dollar TV, and then I always had a three hundred dollar TV in the back, and I'd always make sure the slot next to the fifty dollar TV was empty because when they when they came in, they needed a TV, so their current TV sucked. 
So how good did that $50 TV look as compared to the one that's at home that's broken? How good did that $50 one look? Looked pretty darn good. And then I say, and then I would bring out the $300 TV, put it next to the $50 TV, and what did the $50 TV look like? $50 TV looked like crap. So without the comparison, did they know, could they make a good decision? No, because they're going to say, oh, whatever's in front of me is what? Fine. So contrast is a huge, huge thing. That's why we use it constantly in the 21-point checklist and also in the, uh, um, the um, uh, FIA presentation. The other thing is a big is takeaway, T doing the takeaway. Doing the takeaway. So do we do a takeaway in our, in our system? Yeah. We play the devil's advocate, don't we? Why would that be a good idea? Why wouldn't you want to just keep doing what you're doing? So we do use the takeaway as well. But here are some things, that, some exercises that he gave in the book that make a ton of sense to improve your abilities. Spend a whole day and make a commitment to yourself that you're going to pause three seconds after someone finishes talking. Pause after every time somebody says something, count to three in your head before you continue talking or answering. Do this exercise. Do you think that's a valuable exercise for us to do, guys? Highly valuable. Highly valuable. Consider doing this. The other thing he says is, you know what? Imagine everybody walking into your office as your grandma. Treat everyone as you would your grandma. How would you behave if the person walking to your office was your grandmother instead of a prospect? You are more likely to be genuinely serve them which over the long haul will make you a better person and way more successful. We're the, here to serve, not to sell. We're here to help, not to sell. And would you push your grandma to make decisions faster? Would you push to, or would you be patient with your grandma? Would you get frustrated with your grandma or would you be patient with her? Would you, would you uh, uh, um, just try to shove something down her throat or make sure she understood why something made better? So treat every prospect like your grandmother. And always ask yourself these two questions. If the person you're selling to agrees to buy, will his or her life improve? And when your interaction is over, will the world be a better place than when you began? The whole 21-point checklist, what is it designed to do? These two questions. Make sense? So good. Thanks for listening today, guys. Hope you got some good ideas and, and you see why what we do with the Viking system works and how to stay up, stay positive, and, and uh, view your career, your vocation, your you, the things you do every day in a different way. Thanks, guys. Have a great rest of the week. We'll talk to you all Monday.